Hi, thank you very much, Edith, for that introduction. Hi, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar with Alcorn Immigration Law, Immigration for Children and Dependents, where we will be talking about how spouses and kids can come to the United States and get visas re related to a working um, spouse in the family that's being sponsored for a primary visa. So we're going to cover visas and green cards and a little bit on citizenship if we have time. Um, as Edith mentioned, my name is Sophie Alcorn. I'm a board certified specialist in immigration and nationality law by the State Bar of California Board of Legal Specialization. I'm the founder of Alcorn Immigration Law. Uh, I'm a contributor to TechCrunch with my weekly immigration advice column, Dear Sophie, and also the host of the podcast, Immigration Law for Tech Startups. So thank you so much for joining me today. And just a little bit about our team at Alcorn. Our mission is to overcome borders and expand opportunity and connect the world. And we do that by practicing cutting edge and compassionate and rigorous immigration law so that we can support our clients to build better lives for themselves and their families and the world through the startups that they create. Uh, we have a diverse international team. Many of our team members are immigrants or children of immigrants or married to immigrants. Um, my mom is from Germany. So I definitely have that immigration connection. And my dad was also an immigration lawyer. And we're very proud of our success rate over the last several years as our firm has grown and flourished. And uh, we're particularly proud of our high approval rating of some of the more challenging types of cases during the Trump administration and helping people get into the United States during COVID and that we have a very low percentage of um, requests for evidence that we receive compared to the national averages for many case types. And one of the things that we like to leverage for our um, clients is our vast professional network, including different universities, um, venture capital firms, accelerators and incubators for technology startups, and many media outlets as well. So today we're going to be looking at children and dependents in US immigration law. And let's just start off by saying, who can be a dependent of a work visa? Well, it can be the main person who is being sponsored, the beneficiary of the company's petition. It can be that person's spouse, or it can be that person's child. Uh, it cannot be parents. It cannot be brothers and sisters. Um, there is a way under a business visitor visa sometimes for people to bring um, household domestic servants with them. So that would be a possibility for nannies, for example, but that is not a, a blood re relation. Um, and under U.S. immigration law, it, our law does recognize same-sex marriages. So that is something um, to keep in mind. Now, what is a child? Um, a child is your offspring. Additionally, they are considered a child under immigration law under that definition if they are both unmarried and under 21. So if they're 21 and three weeks old, they would no longer qualify even if they're single. And if they're 18 and they get married, they would no longer qualify even though they're under 21. So that part is important, both unmarried and under 21. And there's lots of different types of children. Um, as we all know, all children are different, all children are special, but even under immigration law, there's different categories of kids. So, I mean, the obvious standard situation would be both parents are married and they have a biological child together during their marriage. Um, that is clearly a child. But the law also recognizes stepchildren and kids born out of wedlock, for example, 
um, or even kids where their parent isn't listed on the birth certificate. So uh, to qualify a child as a stepchild, the parents have to be married before the stepchild turns 18. And you also have to make sure that your stepchild's other biological parent, any parent with custody, that they would consent to their child uh, going with you as your stepchild to the US for purposes of this trip. Um, there's some more subtle rules. I'm not gonna go into the details, but the law does care if the children were born during the marriage or if not, whether they were legitimated or not. And if the mom or the dad is the one applying for the visa and if it's the dad and if they weren't, you know, have a legitimation process, legitimizes, legitimation? I don't know. How the dad legitimates the child. Um, so, those are definitely questions worthy of talking to a lawyer in any one specific instance. Um, and you can also use DNA, uh, DNA tests to prove that you are the child of the parent. So that evidence is also um, broadly considered by the State Department when they're figuring out who can get a visa to come together to the States. So Let's talk about children in our immigrant in our overview of immigration. So most people get a visa first to work in the states and then come here and eventually apply for a green card and then become citizens. Um, children are allowed to come at the visa stage. They are allowed to get dependent green cards at the green card stage, and there is a process for children to become citizens. Um, at that stage, and depending on their age, they can either directly apply for naturalization by themselves, or um, they may automatically become citizens if they're under a certain age and one or both parents um, become citizens in the U.S. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, working spouses have a long-term goal for their family to move to the United States, but there's no immediate job need that is um, calling them here now. So sometimes those families decide that they're simply going to self-petition for green cards if they qualify. Um, and that way they don't have to uproot their kids from their current life um, until the family has the stability of having green cards in the United States. So that is another possibility as well. It's not required for any, anybody to have a visa before they get a green card. So that is something to keep in mind as you're going on this journey. All right, now additionally, let's talk about students because students and professionals um, may have kids somewhere along the way. So if you are a professional in the United States and you came here as an international student on F1 and you're going through this very standard corporate immigration journey, of trying to get an H-1B and then getting a green card and then becoming a citizen, you might have kids at any stage in this journey. And as you probably know, any child born on US soil, regardless of the status of their parents from an immigration perspective is automatically a US citizen. Um, US, there's uh, use solely and use Sanguini, and I can't speak Latin, but anyway, there's two laws. There's law of soil and law of blood, and the U.S. recognizes citizenship in both forms. Some countries only do blood, so it doesn't matter if a guest worker has a kid on their soil. The kid is going to be a citizen of the parent's country, not of that country, but the U.S. recognizes both, so if you then go on to become a citizen and then you move back to your home country with your U.S. citizen kid, you have another kid in your home country, well, then by fact of your citizenship at their time of birth, even though they're outside the US, that second child would also be a US citizen. Um, sometimes parents want to send their children on this student and professional journey. So that's another perspective as well. It's the same pathway. Um, if you're a parent and you're thinking of sending your kids to the United States for an education, university, or a master's degree, for example, um, just know that they, uh, 
uh, might be eligible for summer jobs and internships under the CPT program. And uh, they might be able to work up to three years in the United States after they graduate. So I think it's important for parents to know, and a lot of parents of um, who are in India and China know this because this immigration pattern is so common, but sometimes I talk to international students from Latin America or Europe and their parents know nothing about how this works. So um, one thing you can do is encourage your child to study in the sciences, technology, engineering, or math, and that will allow them to have an extra two years of working in the United States, which is more chances to get a working visa in the US after they graduate unless you really want them to come back home and then tell them to be a philosophy or English or communications major. Um, and then they can be an immigration lawyer like me. Okay. Mm, there's a new path. If you've been attending Alcorn's webinars, you will have heard about this. It's called International Entrepreneur Parole. It's a new program for startup founders. I'll speak about this briefly a little bit later, but just understand it's not a visa, so it's a separate step in the process if you choose to avail yourself to it. But like any other visa or green card, your spouse can come with you, your kids can come with you, and this is one of the categories that does allow your spouse to get a work permit, and I'll be covering more about that in a few minutes. So the most rapid way to come to the United States, if you're not here already, is through non-immigrant visas. And when your family is here in the United States, your kids can go to school. They are allowed to enroll in public school in the community in which you live, wherever you pay taxes, you know, your, your residents. Um, they're also allowed to attend private school. Whether the private school would require them, for example, to have a student visa as opposed to an H-4 dependent visa uh, would depend on the school, but probably they would be fine to attend a private school as an H-4 dependent, for example, but talk to the school about that. Um, typically, at the university stage, any kids that don't have green cards yet through your work, um, they likewise would need to talk to the school and just make sure that they can enroll as um, an H-4 dependent or an L-2 dependent, for example. And then keep in mind that when they turn 21 and they're no longer considered children anymore, they're going to have to do some sort of change of status or visa stamping to get their own F-1 visa to keep studying in the U.S. if they don't have green cards yet. Um, Work permits for kids typically only happen in the green card process. Um, there are some dependent spouse categories where spouses can get work permits, but none of the dependent children categories allow green card uh, allow work permits. usually until you get to the I-485 stage of the green card process. That's the third stage of the green card process. And then everybody in your family is going to be applying for advanced parole travel documents, as well as I-765 um, work permits. And that's one of the ways that they will then qualify for social security numbers in the United States. And then if you really want your um, teenage kid who has a work permit to work, um, that's fine, but keep in mind that different states and um, counties have different rules about the um, minimum age children have to be to be allowed to work, and that differs um, based on where you live. Now, your spouse, what can your what can your spouse do in the U.S.? Well, your spouse can always volunteer. Um, your spouse can usually take a part-time load of classes at a university, um, except if, if they're an F2 spouse, then they might have to get their own F1 visa. And that's something you should talk to the university about, um, about whether they need to have their own independent F1 student status. But it, 
let's talk about when your spouse can work because that's often the biggest question I have. How and when can my spouse work in the United States? And so we'll go through all the visa categories and talk about what the rules are for each of them and the different stages. And just keep in mind, I might use these terms interchangeably. The nickname is a work permit. The formal name is an employment authorization document. The acronym is EAD. These all refer to the same thing. It's a plastic ID card that gives you work permission, and it's usually valid for one to two years at a time. It's the same thing that somebody would get on OPT or STEM OPT, but it will just have a different um, category for which section of the law your spouse is authorized to work under. Okay. So E1 and E2 people, so either investors or traders or employees of companies like um, a German, Italian, or Japanese car company that has a big subsidiary in the United States, often those folks would be on E visas. And spouses are allowed to work. Um, there is some precedent in the law that your, the spou your spouse is allowed to work simply by virtue of um, being in the United States in this status, but it is probably advisable to still go through the process of applying for a work permit just so that that proof is available for your spouse. Um, the H-1B, this is the most common work visa in the United States. It's for people doing a specialty occupation, which usually requires a bachelor's degree. Many professionals are on it. Um, it often comes through a lottery. Usually, your spouse cannot work at the beginning of an H-1B. So if your spouse comes on an H-4 dependent visa, and you're very at the very beginning of your H-1B, they're probably not going to be able to work in the United States. Uh, when can they work? Well, they can work if they independently are selected for their own H-1B, so they're no longer a dependent on your H-1B. Uh, they can also work if you hit certain milestones in the green card process. So most notably, if you're on H-1B and your company is sponsoring you for a green card, if your PERM was filed at least a year ago or your I-140 was, or if you get an I-140 um, approval, those are some of the reasons that would qualify your spouse to be able to get their own work permit. And also when in any of these categories, if you're seeking a green card and your priority date becomes current uh, for your, your green card process, which all usually involves a PERM and an I-140, um, whenever your I-485 is able to be filed because your priority date is current, then your spouse can file the I-485 and also apply for a work permit. Keep in mind that if your family decides to get your green cards in other countries um, through the immigrant visa consular process, instead of the I-485 adjustment of status process, there is no work permit stage available for people who are getting their green cards outside of the United States. Uh, folks on L's, so these are people transferring from a foreign office to a U.S. office of a company. It's for managers and executives, people with specialized knowledge of the company's product or services. Um, typically, you have to have worked for about a year, at least a year abroad before being able to transfer to the States. Um, this is a category where clearly your spouse can work and they will need to file a work permit. So, what that looks like is after you arrive in the US and your spouse can demonstrate that status, then usually the company's immigration lawyers will help your spouse prepare and file the work permit application. And just to be frank right now, it is a um, like about a six month processing time for this card to come in the mail. So if your family is planning to move to the States in the near future and your spouse wants to work, just mentally prepare for the fact that the, the um, 
work permit application process is backlogged right now and it's taking about six months for you to get your work permit. Now with the O-1, this is very common in the tech sector and with founders as well. There's different types of O visas, but the spouse on an O visa has O-3 status and spouses on O-3 are not eligible to work. So for many people in O-1, what they want to do to be able to allow their professional spouse who's irritated at having to be at home and not engage with their career, um, fastest way for them to get a work permit is usually if the O-1 spouse starts the green card process. Depending on your country of birth and your spouse's country of birth, any priority date that you might have, um, typically an O-1 person would be eligible for a green card in the EB-1 category and the EB-2 national interest waiver categories at a minimum. Um, these are green cards for extraordinary ability or doing important work that will help science or the economy, for example. And you can read, I have, I have we have so many resources on all of these topics on our website available for you. Um, and our newsletters, podcasts, YouTube videos, um, articles, blogs, lots of stuff if you want to read more about any of this. But um, typically the fastest way for the spouse of the O-1 holder to work is if the O-1 holder starts an EB-1A or EB-2 national interest waiver green card and you're in the States and you can currently file the I-140 along with the I-485s for the family at the same time, because that will allow your spouse to file that work permit application. Um, J-1 exchange visitors, spouses can work in this category, and I've seen it done in interesting ways. For example, when people want to be entrepreneurs in the United States, they sometimes know that they want to be able to get a work permit as a J-1 spouse. So the other spouse might find an exchange visitor program to come to the U.S. and be in a training program or an internship, or there's some teaching programs, fellowships at universities. There's a, a wide variety of J-1 programs. Um, even some tech companies are willing to hire researchers for a five-year period on J-1. So spouses are eligible for work permits for J, but the thing about J's is they are very specifically for non-immigrant intent exchange visitors. That means once you exchange yourself to the U.S., you're supposed to exchange yourself back to your home country and bring your knowledge home. So it's very difficult to get a green card through this process. And then international entrepreneur parole is the new one. This is the one for startup founders that I mentioned. And um, spouses can work the way, uh, but, but there's a, a limiting factor so far as to travel. And we're trying to change that with the Department of Homeland Security. I'm part of a, a, a coalition working on this. Um, but because it's such a new program, very few people have been able to do it yet. And international, as you can tell from the name, it's not a visa, it's parole. And it's a two and a half year status, but the people at the border, Customs and Border Protection, have been allowing folks in with international entrepreneur parole in one year increments. And then your spouse is eligible to file for a work permit after you arrive in the United States. So there's uh, some careful dances that will need to be done to make sure that your spouse always maintains a valid work permit. And that might mean that you need to leave and re-enter more frequently than you otherwise would just so your spouse can apply to renew his or her work permit on time to minimize any gaps in their employment authorization. Okay, so now regarding green cards and children and spouses, there's a variety of types of green cards. The main beneficiary, the person receiving the, the green card petition, 
um, can always include their spouse and any children under 21 in the green card process, whether they're in the US or in another country. Um, lots of categories here to choose from. And the spouse can just piggyback along the same processing times. Both spouses can have their own independent I-140s and include the other spouses in I-485 on both. And you can have a race to see which green card will be approved first. If you're from India and you married um, maybe an Indian a person of Indian ethnicity who was born in Kenya or um, Dubai, for example, uh, that your spouse would not be in the same weight line for a green card as somebody who was born physically within the country of India, even if they're Indian citizens. So keep that in mind too, that you may have a way to jump the line if your spouse was born in a third country. And um, another thing is that your priority date is always for you as an individual. It is not possible to swap or share priority dates or spots in line for a green card with your spouse. Uh, there's a really lovely law that helps protect children in the green card process. So if you move to the States with kids and your family wants green cards, we always recommend starting the green card process as soon as possible. Sometimes people move when their kids are teenagers or perhaps because they're from India or China, there's a very long wait in line for their green card. So there's something that can kick in and help your kids in this situation. It's called the Child Status Protection Act. And what it does is it prevents your children from aging out when they turn 21 years old. So there's some math involved, but basically you figure out how much time uh, was pending on uh, the green card process between when it was uh, filed to when it was approved. And then you figure out how old the kid is when the visa bulletin becomes current and you subtract that pending time and that becomes their uh, fictional age for purposes of the Child Status Protection Act. And then if that age is less than 21, they can still end up being included in your uh, green card process. Uh, sometimes parents ask me if they can just sponsor their child for a green card, um, even if they've never moved to the United States. Um, the main ways to get green cards are through the lottery or through um, a family sponsorship if somebody's already in the US or through work. So when this has come up and I've seen it work, it is either usually um, a child genius, like a chess star who can um, self-petition as a minor for an EB1A green card in extraordinary ability. That could work, but the catch is kid can't sponsor mom and dad for green cards. So if your child's like 14, you know, can they live independently in the U.S. on that green card without mom and dad? So it's a little tricky to navigate. Um, and the other situation that I've seen... Um, happened a lot when the EB-5 green card, especially for people from China, was really hot um, and the money amounts are under flux and the programs in litigation and there's a lot of changes. The minimum investment is waffling between $500,000 and $900,000. Um, but over the last decade, you know, there's been probably hundreds, if not thousands of families in the world where the parents gifted the $500,000 to their children um, for purposes of their child being the EB-5 investor and securing a spot in line for a green card. So if you want to do that and you're not from India or China, maybe India, the wait times are still okay. So a few other countries have some pretty hefty EB-5 backlogs, but it's a multi-year process. Um, your child can't move here with the green card until it's ultimately approved and then they would get a two-year green card but this is possible. And if you can afford it and you know that you want your child to be able to have a, a professional future in the United States or qualify for in-state tuition, I guess, if that mattered to you, if you had, I don't know, maybe there's some families for which that would make sense in this scenario, but, um, 
Anyway, that is an option that could still work if you give your kids money so they can get their own EB-5 green cards. Now, citizenship is another, um, another process that affects kids. Uh, typically, for the naturalization process, uh, people can apply to become citizens of the United States if they have had green cards for five years or for three years if they're married to a US citizen. Um, and then the usual, you have to spend at least 50% uh, of your time in the US and be a good a person of good moral character and pass a test. Um, but, you know, it works a little bit differently for children. Um, you can't apply to naturalize unless you're 18 years old in the United States. So if you are 18, then you can apply for citizenship on, on your own. If you're less than 18, it's a different process. It's called an N600. It's a certificate of citizenship. And if the parents naturalize, then this is the next step, typically, when the kid is a minor, that the parents will get their certificate of um, naturalization from their oath ceremony, and then they can um, file an N600 for their children, because under the nationality laws, um, children may automatically become citizens when their parents naturalize. And so the N600 um, certificate of citizenship process is just documentary proof that uh, the kid already became a citizen just by virtue of the parents meeting the requirements. So that is another thing to keep in mind. Um, as you go through any of these processes, you know, there's a lot of things to keep in mind about the investment of your time and energy and your resources. Um, obviously, in the family context, taking into consideration your uh, family's desires, their acculturation, your spouse's desires for education and professional advancement, those are all really important factors. And if those are things that matter to your family, while you're going through a work green card or visa process, it's really important that you share that with your immigration law team so that they can craft a strategy um, to support you. you know, we just had that come up yesterday. Uh, somebody's at the very beginning of H-1B and from um, a country with a long backlog and it's very important for them to start the green card as soon as possible. And Establishing a priority date is one reason, but really the main reason is trying to get to a spot where their spouse can be eligible for an H-4 work permit as soon as possible. So it plays out differently for every family, depending on your needs and your circumstances and your desires. So that covers it for immigration for children and dependents. And if you have any questions, I would welcome you to add them to the question and answer panel now so that I can answer them before we wrap up. Um, okay, so here's a question. Uh, do any of the immigration options require an interview with the spouse and children? And thank you, that is a great question. Um, yes, some of the options do. So if you're going for visa interviews at a consulate in your home country, um, for like an H-1B with H-4 visas, usually all of your family members need to show up with you for that uh, visa stamping interview. Um, if your family is in the United States and you guys are going through the I-485 adjustment of status process, there is often an interview that is scheduled. Um, it had not been required for 20 years. Trump made it mandatory. They all got paused in COVID. Uh, so now we like we just had a mom and daughter approved for a green card with no interview through the mom's work. Um, but typically, if there is an interview required related to an I-140 adjustment of status, your spouse would need to attend, but 
your children, they would prefer if you leave the children at home. It's enough to show the kids birth certificates to prove you have real kids together. Um, typically, if they want your spouse to go with you, it's because they also want to make sure that you didn't just get married for the green card. Um, but if you have kids together, that's also proof that you probably didn't just get married for a green card. All right, so thank you so much for that question. And we have another. Um, are there any employment-based options that would be faster to bring my spouse and children to the US? Well, assuming that you're all together in one place now, and you're trying to move here as quickly as possible as a family, um, I would recommend looking at the employment-based non-immigrant visa options, such as an H-1B or an L-1 or an O-1, but because it is COVID, it may take longer for your family to schedule visa interviews and get visa appointments to come here. Um, if you are, you know, recently married, for example, there might be other ways to do it, depending on if your new spouse has any other visa types, but that would be something to talk to an attorney directly about. Wonderful. So All right. Hey, Sophie. Um, we did have a question that was submitted uh, at registration. Great. What uh, of it? So this, it says, um, I'm an adult, a British citizen, and my mother is a U.S. citizen and applied for an I-130 for me in 2015. Is there any way I can come to the U.S. with my family and live with my mom while we are waiting for a decision on, on my application? Oh, I see. So it's an adult whose mom, it's an adult who's in Great Britain and their mom applied for an I-130 for them? Yes. Great. And what year did mom apply? In 2015. And does it say if mom's a citizen or green card holder? Yeah, my mother is a U.S. citizen. Okay, great. And does it say how old this person is? Uh, they are 40. Okay, okay, great. So I'll look it up on the visa bulletin, which was just released for August of 2021. So there is a category for... Well, there's two categories. So this, Edith, does it say if this person is married or unmarried? Um, it does not say, but I'm assuming they are. They're saying yeah. they want to move it with their family. Okay, great. So this would be the F3 category on the visa bulletin, married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. And uh, it was 2014, you said? It is 2015. 2015. All right. So the people who are currently at the front of that line started the process in 2008. Now, I have no idea if that means that it's a seven year wait for you to get your turn in line or more or less. So if you wanted to move to the United States sooner than that, then because you already have initiated that green card process, I would recommend that your family either pursue a dual intent work visa, such as an H-1B or an L-1, which allows you to come temporarily while seeking a green card. So that would be through your work at a company. Uh, or you could simply say, thanks mom, but I'm gonna get a green card on my own. And if you qualify, you could do an employment-based petition uh, where you get your own green card based on your past accomplishments either in the EB1 category for extraordinary ability or the EB2 national interest waiver category if you have a master's or the equivalent and you're doing good things for the country. So thank you, Edith, very much for sharing that question. All right. Well, not seeing any other questions, I want to thank you all for joining us today at Alcorn Immigration Law. If there's anything we can ever do to support you and your family with a particular visa or green card or citizenship process, we would be delighted to support you. Um, please reach out. 
you can always email us at hello at alcorn.law and we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your week.